Hello, everybody, and welcome to this very special episode, uh, a dual episode this week that will be airing on the Hit or Miss Star Trek podcast channel as the finale uh, to series one of the Trek podcast, uh, and that will be debuting a whole new film podcast channel, the Silver Screen podcast, uh, as well, just a couple of days earlier, but with a few things uh, maybe missing that you can catch on the Star Trek podcast on the Sunday. Um, I am not on my own. I have a special guest with me. Would you like to introduce yourself, old man? <laughs> oh, apparently, I'm old man Steve. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I keep this going forward, I think. <laughs> yes, that's my my good friend Stephen Brown is back again to discuss something. And uh, if you couldn't tell from the many tweets, the thumbnail and the banner that you can see on screen, today we'll be reviewing Star Trek from 2009, J.J. Abrams's. Uh, Kelvin timeline reboot, alternate verse, whatever you want to call it. I have an inkling we'll disagree, possibly on quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a completely different show. <laughs> <laughs> but we will uh, we will see. We so just quickly then, before I get started, did you have any sort of thoughts that you want to share that would be kind of spoiler-free on uh, Star Trek 2009 without giving too much away? I think... Next Gen had, well, run its course. Uh, yeah, we, we've had this discussion. I forget which guest it was. I wish I could remember. But we did discuss this briefly and said that it's a shame that Star Trek Next Gen never got its undiscovered country, which was a chance to end on a high, which the original series films did get. Because if it ended with Final Frontier, it would have been disappointing. And mm. sadly, when it comes to Next Gen, it did end on a really weak film in Nemesis. So I think I, I would argue it hadn't quite run its course it would have been nice to get at least one more to at least end it in a decent yeah. place yeah um, I, I, there's some parts of um, nemesis i did enjoy mm. but yeah yeah it, it could there could have been something better there um well the fact that um star trek picard exists shows you that there's still story to tell otherwise that wouldn't be a show that would be out there so this is true yeah, yeah. and it would have been interesting to see where else they could have taken the timeline rather than doing a reboot with it really yeah um, well my guest had said that he really wanted them to do something where it just wasn't the picard and data show which is what it became and i completely agreed and it's kind of like if you've killed off data and nemesis you can kind of shuffle b4 to one side which they did anyway and then actually have it be a proper ensemble thing about the entire crew give Riker something to do for once you know yeah yeah it would be nice the poor guy directed two films and he still didn't do anything. Even in First Contact, he got a whole Borg invasion and he's down on the surface convincing some drunk dude to fly. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> but, yeah, that's <laughs> neither really here nor there. But uh, yeah, anyway, sorry, what were you saying? You, you thought that Next Gen had run its course. Yeah, obviously you have the kind of theater and stuff in that. But yeah, it would be interesting to see where they'd taken that that timeline, that universe next, really. Uh, mm. Obviously, you've got Picard and, and things like that. But, I mean, they, I don't think they could have really done too much, like with a DS9 movie. Um, I mean, mm, maybe yeah. Voyager afterwards or something like that. But, I mean, the other option would be a, a completely different crew and stuff like that. But mm. then you haven't got the... I thought it was his star power, but the, the, the new characters, the out of the recognition of it to, to draw people into going to watch the movies. But yeah, I, I remember us years ago having a conversation about First Contact and how that really drew people into or back to the Star Trek movies. Oh, yeah, completely. And I mean, that's uh, I know it sounds weird, but that's the entire reason Enterprise, in my opinion, exists is because of the success of First Contact, because they wouldn't have been brave enough to go that far back in the timeline otherwise, mm. um, in my opinion, anyway. And I think it's it's kind of it all stems from that. The fact that Cochrane's in that first episode, sort of giving the whole boldly go speech and everything, um, you know, that that would really make sense if you've seen First Contact and there's a lot of humans and Vulcans, which again, that that only really got introduced in First Contact. So, yeah. And, uh, but I mean, t uh, even besides that point, I mean, it was probably responsible for why the Borg took over Voyager after season uh, three as well, because it was popular and he had the effects, so mm -hmm. they were everywhere. But uh, yeah, 
Fair enough. Um, yeah, just in terms of like what you were saying, though, I do remember reading, and I don't know how true this is, that um, they were sort of throwing about ideas for where to bring Star Trek because, as you say, Next Gen had, for whatever reason, they decided not to go ahead. It had run its course, or they've just uh, they've declared it done. Um, and one of the ideas that kind of, to me, looks like it is present here was that they were going to do a Starfleet Academy movie, um, which would have gone back and shown you like the early days of Kirk and Spock in the Academy. Which, in a way, is kind of what you get for the first half hour of this film. That's true. That's true, yeah. Yeah. So I'm wondering how much of that... I, I, at the very least, I'm pretty sure the Kobayashi Maru scene was probably from that script. Because it just seems like it's such an obvious thing to do. The one thing that was mentioned and never seen. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it brings the characters together. Mm. But in a way you wouldn't have expected. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we'll get to that for sure. But, uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, I don't want to go too much into it without uh, sort of giving away my thoughts, but I'll briefly give a synopsis in case anybody's listening to this who hasn't seen the film, but it's not something I would fully recommend. Um, so just to, this is going to be difficult because this is a very weird, twisty, turny, time travel uh, type of movie. But basically, um, a Romulan ship travels back in time from the, what at the time I guess was the present day of the Trek universe, the 2380s, uh, to just before the original series and changes time and a whole new timeline is born where Captain Kirk's father is killed and events change from there and this vengeful Romulan uh, sets out for revenge against Spock, Vulcan, Earth and everyone involved and the crew of the Enterprise protect the the entire universe very poorly in some cases and defeats this angry Romulan dude. So that's that's the brief nutshell synopsis. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what, fair, do you think fair. I kind of got everything in there? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, awesome. Well, I'll, I'll quickly uh, get us into it then and start off by saying that, um, first of all, I love the opening scene of this movie, with the exception that I think that the Kelvin is the ugliest starship that the franchise has ever produced. And it's a dumb idea. <laughs> it's just so crap. The idea that it has a tiny drive section above the saucer and a massive single warp nacelle underneath. What's that about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can't disagree. That is. <laughs> That is, you know, it, it, it sort of breaks the the thing of it. There's always two water cells. What's going well, on? Well, there's always, yeah. Gene Roddenberry, for whatever reason or whoever, it might have had not been him. It might have been one of the designers had said that there doesn't have to be two, but there always has to be an even number, which is why you always get two or four. I will point this out as well, even though it's really, really ridiculous and churlish. My particular bugbear is the um, registry on the Kelvin is the wrong format because it's uh, it's NCC O five one four shouldn't have the O. <laughs> it would just be 514. Um, yeah. And the reason for that is that I think it's J.J. Abrams' grandfather's birthday, which would be the American style, so month first, um, uh, which I get. But again, you wouldn't start the registry with a zero. That's redundant. <laughs> you would just have yeah. a digit. I mean, <laughs> you know, but Americans are daft. Apologies to any American viewers. <laughs> well, yeah, Americans are daft at telling dates. They do it the wrong way around. Yes, but, uh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't have killed them to make it 1405. That would have made perfect sense. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. And I have to commend Thor in this scene, who does a brilliant job <laughs> um, act, acting human and not giving away his Asgardian heritage. Uh, we know that uh, as soon as the ship was destroyed, he flew back through space and arrived back on Asgard. So... Uh, it was nice of him. Not so good that he knocked up that Earth woman, but you know, what are you gonna do? <laughs> yeah, but but then again, you had his haircut, so was it you know, post Ragnarok? <laughs> yeah, so we're talking about Chris Hemsworth, of course, uh, pre pre Thor fame, who gets to be in this film for about ten minutes at the very start, playing George Kirk, Kirk's father. But to be fair, he is brilliant in that ten minutes. You can see. Kind oh, well, of, or, or yeah. do you mean twelve? Oh, yeah, to Captain of Assassin for 12 minutes. <laughs> Saved, oh. what was it, 800 lives, of course. Yeah. yeah. I love that line. <laughs> Again, we'll get there. But, um, you know, I have to commend. You can kind of see how Hemsworth became a star off the back of this because he, he is the central idea of the film, I guess, in a lot of ways. And he does really smash it out the park in that opening scene. But uh, I do find it amusing that it was before he got cast in anything that he was doing this. Um, so he hadn't been cast by the MCU or whatever else. And that's how they were able to get him. And then they tried to bring him back for the much mooted and never actually happened fourth Kelvin film. Uh, and they were just, yeah, at this point, his his stock had gotten so high that they just couldn't afford him, basically. <laughs> yeah. Which is a shame. I think if actors want to be in a movie, they can yeah. dictate that price. Oh, but, yeah, yeah. you know, if it's just a little bit part, then, you know, why, why not? Why not just turn up for 
I don't know, half oh, a million or something yeah. ridiculous. Well, in fairness, this, uh, yeah, this idea wasn't going to be a bit part. They were going to revolve the whole thing about around the Chris's Hemsworth and Pine, and it would be a time travel adventure and Kirk meeting his father and whatever. So goes the rumor. Um, but again, both of the Chris's at this point just aren't affordable if you want to make a movie that will make what the Star Trek films do at the box office, which have never really sort of set the whole world on fire. Off um, what percentage then? Well, this is this is why Hollywood should hire us, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> or at least you. As you've said, though, I mean, if it's not going to make a considerable amount in comparison, certainly like a Marvel movie or something like no, that, no, definitely not. Then no. that percentage still might not be worth the time. But you know, I think what if put it's them a project uh, that excites you, then, then why not? Why not? Definitely. No, I think what put them off is the fact that even Star Trek Beyond did really poorly financially, which is a shame because it's, in my opinion, it's the best of the three sort of reboot Kelvin films. But nobody went to see it, which is a shame. <laughs> mm, mm. But, uh, yeah, in my opinion, that was marketed poorly because that was on the 50th anniversary year of Star Trek and they never made any reference to that really or anything, which they could have really played up, but never mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, back to Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, talking of people who are in the MCU, I noticed as well that the captain of the Kelvin is the terrorist from the first Iron Man. <laughs> So it's, oh, uh, yeah. it's kind of You're odd right. that the, the captain and first officer are both the sort of key Marvel characters from phase one. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, everybody's everybody's doing a really good job. And I have to say that uh, that's, the, the space effects and stuff look really cool. So you can't really mm, fault this. Yeah. And like I said, it's a, it's a good action scene. Yeah, then we get our credits and everything. And then the scene that I don't like, <laughs> which is basically young Kirk being a bit of a rebel, uh, apparently having time traveled back to 1984. Uh, because <laughs> he's uh, listening to an old Beastie Boys and has a Nokia cell phone and he's driving in a supposedly antique Corvette and it's just probably like... the only thing I've survived in the car yeah <laughs> exactly yeah and at this point I'm just like what film am I watching here this is just what are you doing Abrams <laughs> you're making a track yeah. film for Brian Allen <laughs> yeah that, that part was like okay I get it he's being rebellious but there's rebellious and there's you know, off your rock as destructive hmm there's yes, no context to why he would want to destroy that car. Well, I think th there is a deleted scene where it shows that his stepfather, who he sort of nicked it from, was was borderline abusive and not a very nice bloke, and that's what had driven him uh, to drive off and stuff. But again, that's that's context I think you need as opposed to just, I'm just joyriding because I'm a rebel. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're going to destroy the car, you drive at the edge and push it off. You yeah, <laughs> almost kill yourself in the process. Um, well, yeah, but I think that's the point, isn't it? It's because it's Kirk. It's like, no, I like the thrill of driving fast and almost dying and whatever. But yeah, again, it's it's the twenty fourth century. Why the heck would he be driving around in a car anyway? It just doesn't make sense. At least have it be like a hover vehicle or something futuristic looking. I know it's stupid and it's yes, it's nerdy, but yeah, it just nerdy, throws you out. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, and what that canyon was, actually, I'm not sure. I've got no yeah. idea. Somewhere in Iowa, apparently. Yeah, I was in Iowa. <laughs> I, I, I might my Google as we're talking like what giant canyons are there in Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. But hey, it's got three hundred years to exist, so who knows what might happen between now and then? Um, yeah. Uh, the next scene, of course, uh, thematically would make sense, and it's Spock as a child, uh, and we yeah. see him being being bullied by other Vulcans which I know is part of canon. It's definitely been mentioned in sort of Journey to Babel and in Yesteryear from the animated series. But watching this scene just reinforces to me that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because the Vulcan bully children are not acting very logically and they don't seem to have... Their motivation is very emotional. They're just being jerks to kind of have a fight, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, so... I know people, human children are very like that, but I would have liked at least a little explanation of like, well, they haven't yet mastered controlling their emotions and they're being jerks because they have their own, you know, lack of mastery and it's violence and whatever that in Vulcan's past that causes this. But as it is, it just, I, I was just watching it like, so what's their motivation for doing this? It's yeah, very weird. I suppose the, he mentions the, the ritual later on. Uh, Call it out. Yeah. That's, that was that. I was like, oh, what's it called? Didn't embarrass himself. Um, <laughs> well done, you. Yeah, where they also purge all emotion. So maybe that obviously they're maturing, but haven't gone through that stage where they've really tied down their minds, and so they still have that little bit of emotion which they're they're learning to control along with their education. Um, yeah, I just don't see. I, I, it's a similar problem than I had last week's track episode talking about Broken Bow, which is I don't see the Vulcans as being people that would be that inherently racist. 
where they're kind of like, um, your father's a traitor for marrying a Vulcan, a non-Vulcan woman or whatever. And it's like, would they really be like that? It doesn't, it doesn't seem like a very Vulcan or a very logical thing to, to do. Um, but again, human beings would have that problem, but for a Vulcan, it just seems odd. I would have assumed there's constant interbreeding, <laughs> especially considering every seven years they get like, you know, they've got to have sex or they die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyway... Um, I will say though that it gives you straight after that, um, as we kind of get a bit more advanced and we see Spock in his older years, that awesome scene you're talking about where he kind of uh, talks to his mum and says, "If I was to undergo colonar, would you take it as a sort of personal insult? I hope you wouldn't." And she says, "You know, no matter what you'd be, I'd, I'd be a proud mother." Which I love that scene. Uh, it's a little moment, but I wish we'd had more moments like that. Um, it's really cool. And the scene afterwards is probably one of my favourite parts of the film where. Uh, the Vulcan played by W. Morgan Shepard, a uh, frequent Star Trek and other sci-fi guest star, mm -hmm. uh, accepts Spock into the Academy, but then basically gives him this sort of backhanded compliment. Oh, it's amazing what you've done considering your disadvantage. And Spock presses him on it. And what disadvantage? Well, your human mother, of course. So then Spock just sort of as sarcastically as you like, is just like, well, then I'm declining. I'm going to go to to Starfleet yeah. Academy. And uh, I don't wish to express anything other than gratitude. And then, Live long and prosper that <laughs> you could possibly yeah. muster. <laughs> so yeah, I love that. And I love the, the cleverness of them saying, well, no Vulcan has ever declined admittance in Spock's response of like, well, as I'm half human, your record's untarnished, then isn't it? It's yeah, just, that was a good slap in the face. <laughs> it really is a perfect sort of throwing it back his uh, his insult at him. So I like all that stuff. And I I just love Spock as a character. He's always been my favorite character, to be fair. Mm. Um so yeah, then we we flash ahead a little bit further and back to Earth uh, in Iowa, of course, uh, and then we're at a bar uh, with Uhura and Kirk, uh, which I think yeah, this whole bar fight scene and everything, it's a really cool way to introduce Kirk, and it's exactly the kind of, it's exactly how I imagine Shatner's Kirk being in his younger years, if that makes sense. Like mm. this, this to me makes a lot more sense than I'm just gonna nick a car and try to kill myself off a cliff or whatever. Like I can see Shatner's Kirk in his young days being like, yeah, calm down, buddy, and then getting into a a fight against four people because he's so cocky. He's like, "We'll get more people, and then we'll have an equal fight," kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I sort, I sort of would have liked to have seen what he was doing with himself instead. Mm. He must yeah, have been well, doing something. That's. I think the point is that they're, they're basically saying that there's a few people at that bar because they're about to ship out to the academy, and mm. Iowa for some reason is a key place here. Um, but he was just in the bar because he's just been you know, patrolling around bars, getting drunk and hitting on chicks and not much else. But you're right, that's not super clear um, that he's just being a bit of a layabout because he hasn't applied or whatever. But it does give you the chance for that. Again, you've referenced it earlier, the fantastic recruitment speech from Pike to Kirk, yeah, um, which gets me hairs on the back of the neck every time. You know, your father was captain of a starship for 12 minutes, saved 800 lives. I dare you to do better. It's like, oof. well, yeah. you can see why Kirk responded to that. And uh, I will say here as well that one thing I didn't really realize what was going on until I was listening to the audio commentary one of the times I watched this is that um, Kirk picks up a Kelvin salt shaker from the bar, which I yes. was never sure what that was supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, all but, the yeah. tops come off it. Cause I looked, yeah, I noticed that myself and I was just watching it recently. Mm. Uh, yeah, it was actually the, the shape. And I was like, oh, that's, it's odd to have that actually there. Yeah, it's, it's very convenient. I suppose it makes sense that ship would perhaps have become famous. Uh, but at the same time, does Starfleet have salt shakers of, of starships? I mean, we don't we don't really go around with salt shakers based on Formula One cars or whatever, do we? It seems like an odd I mean, choice. I can Google that and prove you wrong. <laughs> well, you're probably right, but in a bar at least. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not like as if it's like the the I don't know the Starfleet Academy cafeteria bar mm. type thing where you know, you might have your ship things, but it, it's a bar near exactly, yeah. where you know, the recruitment is. So yeah, I don't get why they would have starships for that. Yeah, but it's a cool moment. It gives Kirk a chance to stare at the ship and sort of, ooh, he's he's wistfully wondering. Um, but yeah, related to how I, I kind of get annoyed at the convenience of Iowa being like apparently a Starfleet Academy, you know, uh, feeding ground or whatever. Why the heck is the Enterprise being built on Earth? It's just to give you that quick moment of Kirk seeing it under construction before he goes off to the Academy. But it makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah, well, this is it. That that it's a prelude to what's to come, really, isn't it? It's like, oh, he has this thing, but obviously, it takes an additional uh, three years, we presume, oh. um, to get finished. But I mean, it looked pretty well 
built. It did by because that it would, stage. that's my point. It has to look recognizable enough for that scene to work. But it just doesn't. It, like within the Trek universe, ships aren't built on planets because then you'd have to launch them. <laughs> they don't generally go planetary atmosphere and stuff. Don't get me started on Into Darkness dropping it into water and stuff. That's a different movie, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it, I believe it was always supposed to be able to go in the atmosphere. I think it was always able to land a saucer in an atmosphere if necessary, but it wasn't just like the ship could fly up and down through. I mean, it's not Voyager. Um, yeah, Voyager made a big, big deal about that. Um, exactly, yeah. Land and stuff. But, yeah. Yeah, um, I think but, it was always supposed to in some fashion, but it was never, yeah. you know, something they did. Yes, but even despite my misgivings that it's not something Trek ever did, even on the dedication plaque, and it's nerdy that I know this, even on the dedication plaque on the Kelvin Enterprise, it says that it was constructed at Utopia Planitia Fleet Yards Mars, which is where it should be made, because it's where everything <laughs> always is. So that scene makes even less sense. <laughs> I was going to say, oh, well, maybe it was just a similar ship, but no, no, it does show you the registration <laughs> yeah. on the ship. Um... <laughs> but yeah, uh, related to that, though, again, why does Kirk have a, a current-day motorbike? It's just like they forget that it's supposed to be set so far in the future. Well, that's it. Yeah, even when he was younger, they had flying motorbikes. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, the cops did, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, this is then, uh, I don't know how many years, we're gonna, how, at least 10, 12 years. Exactly, yeah. Quite yeah. old years when he, he joins. Well, they say it's uh, been 25 years since he was born, so he's 25. Oh, so if you say, okay. he's, say he's eight in the opening scene... Maybe well, let's say ten because it's quicker maths. <laughs> yeah, so, there you go. So it's been fifteen years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You'd think that would be a more common thing to buy. I mean, you know, it, it's one of those things. He likes the retro thing, maybe, or, or something like that. But yeah, yeah. They do this a lot, though. It's the same as there's a motorbike stunt scene in Star Trek Beyond that just has no place there. Because I think he finds like a motorbike on the Franklin, and it's like, why the heck would a starship be carrying an old two wheel, you know, 20, 20 inch vehicle? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> but uh, ah, yeah, they, they want their action movie, and I guess that's that's that. And it is kind of cool that he just throws the keys and gives it to that guy because he's not going to need it anymore. Um, mm. And uh, perhaps the most important thing to get from this scene is. Yes, it's very Kirk type cocky to be like, I'm going to graduate in three years, not four. <laughs> so that's a perfectly in character moment. But the best part of this scene is definitely the introduction of McCoy, uh, yes. the MVP of the scene by far, because Carl Urban is just channeling D. Kelly so perfectly. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Especially when you think that guy is, you see, that Australian or, or a New Zealander, I'm not sure which. Certainly, he doesn't have like a Southern American type accent. And he does it so perfectly. You would never doubt he's he's from there and he's that crotchety old guy. And yeah, I just absolutely love the way that he's... And he's exactly as as you remember Bones being and sort of all like, oh, space is disease and death and I don't want to see it out the window. And, yeah. <laughs> grumble, <laughs> grumble, grumble. Um, and it partly annoys me that they felt the need to explain the Bones nickname because it's that prequelitis thing of like, oh, you're on your own you're solo i'll call you han solo which you know, <laughs> it always bugs me but at the same time it's kind of a funny enough joke that i I let it go <laughs> yeah i mean yeah they're sort of going oh this is your name and yeah they didn't need to say that but um it, it's sort of yeah that acknowledgement but why pick on it and call him bowen's all i'm yours later it doesn't make well, sense. I kind of, it kind of makes sense it's like that was the moment they bonded and he introduced it and it's kind of a, a light like ribbing but Nobody was ever in any doubt that it was just short for Sawbones because he's a doctor. We all just accepted that and moved on. Yeah. <laughs> so we didn't need like, no, there's another reason, and it's so funny. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll let I'll let them off because it did kind of make me chuckle, and at least it's delivered well. So yes, this is true. Uh, this is true. Yeah, and again, that dialogue is pretty memorable. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of a thrill because you know what the, where the nickname comes from, and they never sort of have. They at least avoid that scene where Kirk goes, ha ha, then from now on I will call you Bones. It's just that it... <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yes, that would have been a sighing moment. Uh, yeah. oh. it, when you step too far, you just get that moment of McCoy, like, I've got to go to Starfleet. My wife got the whole planet in the divorce. All I've got left is my bones. And that's, you know, the fans know, but anybody else would uh, would be just, ah, it's just a bit of dialogue. Um, mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, the next scene that you get in the film kind of bugged me because it's Nero spotting the jellyfish with Spock in uh, coming through the portal. Now, as I've pointed out, this is 25 years after Nero arrived, as they say, multiple times. And yeah. there's 
several scenes that are cut here that explain exactly what Nero's been doing for 25 years. And I really yes. don't think they should have been cut because if you watch the film as it is, there's a little bit of dialogue later that kind of gets into what happened, but it kind of seems like Nero just parked up there for 25 years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just disappeared for 25 years. Okay. But he even said, oh, and I've been waiting all this time for you to go. But it's like, so what? You just flew to that part of space, parked up the massive mining ship, and we're like, now we wait. Ah, <laughs> just chill it out. But yeah, there's some really cool deleted scenes, and they are on the DVD, or at least the Blu ray. Um, the, the Narada basically, when it was crippled, drifted into Klingon space, got captured. They ended up on Rora Penthe, because of course, we're going to make a reference to a previous film. Um, he was sort of, uh, you know, abducted by the Klingons, had to serve there, spent 20 years or whatever, hard labor in the mines of Rorapente, kicked some Klingon butt when he realized it was time, saved his first officer guy and a few of his crew, went back to the ship and then arrived to where Spock was uh, going to be coming. So at least they explained where he'd been and give you a little bit of cool action. Um, but I they, mean, yeah, yeah, but I guess why that, you know, why that was cut, because what? How? Well... <laughs> Well, yeah, but it, it's cut, but it's still there. That's the thing, because you could ask the same questions anyway, because the, you get the scene later where Uhura says, oh, they've destroyed like 43 Klingon warbirds or whatever um, in an escape from the Klingon, a Klingon prison world, she says. So it still happened, and it's still in dialogue, so why well, not just show it? You know, for, for 25 years then, you've had the Klingons who've had this hyper-advanced ship sitting there, <laughs> well, yeah, in terms of the Narada. I don't remember, though, if there was a reason for that, because it's been a while since I've watched those scenes. It may have been, like, cloaked somewhere or something. I just know that they got kind of captured and taken away. Um, so I can almost forgive that. But I do remember the other reason it got cut was because they hadn't decided which of the Klingons they were using, like the smooth head or the bumpy head. Uh, um, yeah, and yeah. so <laughs> there's something that I think is really cool, which was a cool compromise, where all the Klingons are wearing metal helmets. <laughs> which cover their foreheads so you can't see either way uh, and fair, fair. the metal helmets have like a ridge pattern in so that you could believe it's there if you want to but you don't have to assume it so they just mm. didn't commit either way <laughs> which is kind of like I, I wish in a way they'd done that when the Klingons do appear and into darkness and just leave it a bit vague because it would have been a cool little touch for me but mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. never mind I think you, it would have been nice to have those so that it didn't seem like Nero was just like, now we wait here. Uh, we got plenty of snacks, everybody. <laughs> it's going to be 25 long years. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, I mean, that's a good job for the, uh, the age slowly as well. Yeah, well, <laughs> exactly. But then again, they all, they all say that uh, young Kirk and Spock and whatever look really familiar. And I'm like, do they? <laughs> look like different people to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That like true the scene yeah. at the end when Nero goes, I know your face from Earth's history. Do you, Nero? Because he doesn't look the same to me, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, indeed. Then again, Nemesis does the same thing and claims that uh, Patrick Stewart used to look like Tom Hardy. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so there you, go. you know, I think maybe in another thirty years we should get a picture of Tom Hardy and go. You know, <laughs> the irony is that uh, Patrick Stewart and his younger days just look the same. You could take a picture of him from that many years ago, like the seventies or whatever. He just looks the same. He doesn't look all that yeah. different. <laughs> yeah. uh, sure. And plus, Tom Hardy looks weird, ball. But again, different film. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, it's always had some hair in most of his films. Yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, so uh, yeah, Kirk, uh, Kirk's encounter with Gala, the uh, Orion, the green-skinned Orion woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that that's in the film because whether it's true or not, that's exactly how everyone remembers Kirk. Just like he's always good around seducing green women. <laughs> 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 but I also <laughs> love that. This this takes place after we've had that sort of controversial reveal in Enterprise that the women aren't really the slaves. They're the ones kind of luring the men with their cheeky pheromones and stuff. And it's so it's kind of a nice touch that whether they realize that or not that Gail is the one like, I've, I, she doesn't like it because I've been told not to keep bringing men back to the room. So I just have this uh, this sort of head cannon that Gail is out every night and just snaring men left and right. Just yeah. <laughs> captivating them and then just got really unlucky one night and got Kirk who was just up for it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, mutual. It's like, oh, hello, hello. Yeah, uh, but yeah, that's a great actress, by the way, who deserved better than this very brief cameo called Rachel Nichols, who plays Gala. Uh, do check out either the first G.I. Joe film or the TV series Continuum if you'd like to see more of her without green skin. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, and as I say, that's, that scene kind of also fills you in on the, the backstory of what happened with the Klingons being attacked and uh, 
how Nero got away, but it's just background dialogue that Uhura gets while Kirk's hiding. So you kind of have to listen for it. But still, yeah, it's uh, just an excuse to see her in her underwear. So, and yeah, it's a good excuse to watch to see two women in their underwear in one scene. But uh, yeah, we know these films are notorious for that. We we we've all seen Alice Eve's underwear many times. Uh, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> Into <sighs> darkness, probably the best scene in that abysmal movie. But never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I enjoy a bit of that. I enjoyed bits and pieces. I was just being uh, facetious, but uh, mm. yeah. The, the next scene, anyway, to take us there is kind of what I was alluding to before. So it's the Kobayashi Maru scene, because uh, Kirk mm. had mentioned he was off to study and uh, then wasn't. He was bedding a green woman, uh, but he seemed very cocky with McCoy earlier. And we find out that uh, obviously the reasoning why is like he's he's ace in the test. Um, it's it's pure fan service that this is here, but it works because it's really nice. Like I said, if we'd seen it previously and they were redoing it, I think I'd have been annoyed. Um, but we never saw Kirk taking the test. We saw a version of it when Savick was taking it, I think. Um, but this is just cool enough to see. And this is the scene, I think, where Pine is the most like, yes, that is exactly the same character. He's acting, I can picture Shatner playing that exactly the same way. Yeah, you know? yeah, that was it. <laughs> yeah. And, and that was, well, that's the scene where they, they, they beat each other for the first time, really. Also, Ooh. they so, start coming you know, head to head and, and, and stuff like that and have this, this problem with each other, uh, yeah. It sets them as like a, well, not quite enemies, but in opposition um, with some uh, animosity between them, and because of how that interaction took place, really. Yeah, and I do love that touch as well. That the again, if you're a fan and you know these things, then you appreciate the little humor that relationships are inverted from what they normally would be so that mm. because he finds out Spock's done the test and then he reports him on whatever you get Kirk saying well oh, who was that pointy eared bastard and McCoy going I don't know but I like him and again fans know it should be the exact opposite of that yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's a little sort of like haha we hit, we see where this is going <laughs> kind of thing yeah. Um, but yeah I love that scene because I think as I said Pine is just that's his best scene in the film and uh, they've um, they've said in sort of commentaries and stuff that it's a complete coincidence but I still like the fact that Kirk is kind of cockily eating an apple while he does the test, which he's also doing when he describes the test in Wrath of Khan. <laughs> so it's a nice uh, bit of symmetry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, again, purely accidental, but yeah, <laughs> sometimes these these things are. Um, I will say as well, this is this is not apropos of nothing, but I'm kind of sad that we didn't see more of the Kobayashi Maru ship in the simulation because. I've seen the Eagle Moss model, and it's quite a cool design. So it's just a shame it didn't appear more. Because <laughs> there is a ship there. It, it, uh, it's very briefly in one, one corner of the view screen, but it's there. Uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, and then that, that's when, of course, you're at the hearing, and then they get the distress call from Vulcan, and things get, for me, a little bit too manic. Um, you know, oh, Vulcan's under attack. Where are we going? Be assigned to this ship or that ship. And Kirk, you're not allowed to go, and now you are going. And it's like all right we get the picture you know what i mean you're trying to be all we've we've had some slow moments so let's throw in some heavy quick paced action and nonsense and whatever but didn't really work for me and uh yeah this is your first hint of the spokuhura relationship which i just hate because i just don't think it should exist either um but that's just me i know again that it was hinted at in the original series that uhura definitely did fancy him she brought it up a couple of times and tried serenading him and stuff but I just don't. It, it's clearly them two were together because they wanted a romance, and they just happened to be well. Uhura just happened to be the only female character available to them, and you know, like ah, she'll do. She she can be with Spock, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, what were your thoughts anyway? Do you agree or disagree? Um, I think it was an interesting way to take it, really. Mm. Um, because all I sort of remember about the romance between the crew, certainly in the movies, anyway was the sort of thing between her and Scotty. Yes, in the uh, five and yeah. possibly six, but yeah, definitely Star Trek five. So, yeah, it was, it was interesting that they took it in in a different way. Um, but that leads in, obviously, the bit where she's like demanding to be uh, on the Enterprise and things like that. Yeah, I appreciate that scene in the regard that, like, it, it's, it is logical that Spock would be like, I wanted to avoid accusations of favouritism, so he's assigned her to the Farragut. Uh, which apparently exists like a century early, but again, <laughs> neither here nor there. Um, but then she you knows she wants to go to the Enterprise because the best ones end up on the Enterprise. So, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, that's it. It's a, it's a flagship. It's just being launched. So it's it's surprising that they would put recruits 
uh, you know, from the academy on that ship, and that ship wouldn't have already been pretty much fully crewed anyway. Yeah, because ninety. Well, th- having said that, they do kind. They almost kind of make effort to to have reasons for everybody that's a cadet to shuffle into the thing. Because it's like there's probably cadets on them to start off on the lower decks. No pun intended. Um, because Uhura is like in the like decks with all the other linguists, but she's up on the bridge when Kirk's taking her to play in the Klingon signal, and then the actual communications officer can't differentiate the Romulan dialect or whatever, um, and Uhura yeah. can, so she gets assigned there. So it's kind of it explains at least why she's in there. But having said that, you are right that like the pilot and navigator, as far as we know, are cadets or are they? No, they actually they're already like a lieutenant and an ensign, which is within it weird because it means that they graduated ahead of Kirk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all over the place in, in this movie, but uh, yeah. So no, I mean you're right, but it is it is just what the film does, which is we need to get everybody where fans would know they are. And we don't care how, how illogical it is. We're just going to do it, which is again one of my my issues with the film. But yeah, yeah. It, it happens. So. <laughs> um, well, that's it. for me, it's that that scene sort of rolling back a bit on it is was it's like that that the traveling from Earth to Vulcan, mm-hmm. which you know because that we were talking there, just happened to look up was apparently sixteen and a half light years. But um, yeah, it, it sort of happens, and obviously they you know the the knock. Um, Scott Boone's knocks out Kirk. You know, yeah, well, he gives him the vaccine for something that causes effect or whatever, so that he can sneak him on board by claiming he's a patient. Or yeah, yeah. again, it doesn't make a whole ton of sense when you think about it, but don't just don't engage your brain, I guess. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's that that, that time thing of you know them traveling. It it doesn't say you know, we'll be there in an hour, two hours. Or, or oh no, they do. They there. say that they say that they'll be there in like three minutes, but I forget. Like I don't know how true that is, but that definitely there's definitely a line of dialogue where they say we'll be at Vulcan in three minutes. Yes, but at that point they have already wakes up, though. That's when he wakes up. I didn't think he was out for that long, was he? I thought well, it was that's crazy. it. Yeah, <laughs> this is it. You don't know how long he was actually unconscious for. Because uh, if he's just been given something to knock him out, it's going to be more than three minutes. It's going to be, you know, is it an hour or two or whatever, you know? In which case, fair enough, they've been travelling for a bit. No, but it's it makes be... out it's been ten minutes. I think it's got to be fairly instant because the whole point is that he hears the thing about the lightning storm and before he kind of falls and gets knocked out and goes under, he's like, no, no, lightning storm, I know this, it's familiar, and then gets knocked out and then immediately kind of, as far as I read it, immediately wakes up and he's like, I've got to find Uhura, get everyone, I've got to yeah, I've yeah. got warn her about it. <laughs> if you get an anaesthetic, though, that knocks you out, you won't waken up from that. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, if, but... if they want you out for a good hour, you're going down for an hour. <laughs> Yeah, but it's Kirk. He's he's amazing. <laughs> he hasn't got super blood. Let's not move on yeah. to another movie. He's he's the son of <laughs> he's the son of Thor, man. He can do what he wants. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lord of Sparkles. Am I right or wrong? It's a Lord of Sparkles. Uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. But yeah. <laughs> what what the Grandmaster calls Thor. Oh, it's been ages since I saw that movie. Oh, Lord of <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get slayed probably somewhere here. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to move on really quickly. But but yeah, yeah, they get yeah. there and all, all the pieces destroyed, and they're only sitting on air for like, what, two two minutes? That's it. Well, that's the thing I was going to say that I, I really don't like the stupid parking brake type joke. Mm. But at the same time, when I rewatched the film today, I realized that that's literally what saves their life because that's the reason they arrive a little bit later than the rest of the fleet so that they aren't like there when they all get destroyed. Um, but having said that, as soon as Nero spots which ship it is, he doesn't destroy it anyway. Because like, haha, Enterprise, I will. Yeah, I know Spock's on board, apparently, and I will make you watch. Haha. <laughs> but, uh... Yeah, he's he's a you know a student of, um, of not quite ancient history, but um, early Federation history, apparently. Well, I can accept that the Enterprise, particularly the original or the original with that registry, is really famous. I mean, even Voyager knows all about the crew and its adventures and whatever else and it probably is the most famous ship in starfleet which probably has spread to other civilizations and stuff um yeah but, it, but for a random roman and minor i know <laughs> well he knows spock that's the thing and he knows that he's specifically after revenge against spock um so if he's been hanging out with him he probably knows that this is the famous spock from the uss enterprise and whatever else yeah um, that's true. So, that is true. Again, I can accept it because he knows Spock in the future. If it had just been like, I don't know you, but I'm annoyed at you anyway, kind of thing. Um, 
it kind of does make sense that, to link them together in in that way but uh yeah one thing that doesn't make sense and this is my biggest issue with the film and it always will be why in the world would captain pike a supposedly competent officer decide to make a currently disgraced and under investigation illegal stowaway cadet the first officer just from nowhere why he believes in him that's why <laughs> oh great that's fine then <laughs> it's good job it worked out otherwise he looks like an absolute idiot <laughs> That that just struck me as the stupidest possible decision. It was it was solely to get Kirk there, and it's like, what? And Starfleet are gonna be okay with this? And at the end of the movie, they're just like, yeah, we fully agree, we support this. Decision. No, court martial a lot of them for such a stupid move. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, <laughs> uh, that's just me. Clearly, a lot of people don't have an issue with that, or I've heard the argument of oh, it's time getting them where they belong and whatever else. But no, stupid. He's going yeah. into a huge, a hugely dangerous battle situation against a ship like 20 times their size and goes, ah, Spock, you're captain. All right, I can live with that. Spock's clearly already a commander. He's been serving in Southie for a while. You there, disgraced cadet who might well be expelled. Your first officer for no good reason whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that was just to set up the later bit. It was like, oh, that's a shame. Yeah, which I'll get to because that makes even less sense. But regardless, um, <laughs> the uh, the next scene is is the orbital skydive that I wanted to briefly touch on because <laughs> it's action for the sake of it. But I will forgive it because it's well done. Like I like the scene, uh, really well done, and I like the tension and the fact that again, yes, the red shirt guy immediately gets killed because <laughs> of course. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, and yeah, the, the hockey joke, the cheeky joke that we mentioned about Sulu. Uh, you know, my combat training's in fencing, so he has the collapsible sword that he pulls out to attack the Romulan and everything. And, uh, uh, yeah, which yeah. isn't really so much a defensing weapon, but yeah, okay. Well, it's the nearest thing you can get. Why Why would he have a sort of really pointy sort of fencing sword with him? He could possibly have a big machete type in case he was to land in a jungle or whatever if it was a survival kit, so... I thought of it like that anyway, rather than just like, oh. why? <laughs> well, where are their phasers? Because he has to, to when they realize that the engineer red shirt guy had the charges, Kirk's response to that is, uh, oh, we do this, and steals the Romulan disruptors to blast the heck out of the platform. And it's like, you didn't take phasers with you? <laughs> are we just pulling the scene apart too much, I think? <laughs> <laughs> A little bit, but again, these are sort of logical fallacies that you're like, eh, you're you really, know, you know, why <laughs> blow up the, the cable thing that was hanging, you know, hanging well, down with the photon torpedo. Um, well, I, I pres there's probably reasons for that. Like it would, yeah, end, reasons. it would, it would cause a chain reaction that would end up destroying the planet or something. I'm sure there's a, a logical reason. Or the, the interference that prevents them from beaming would prevent a torpedo or something. You can hand wave that away, I guess, in a weird way. Oh, but, yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't, but you could. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> Um, related to that though, um, it's very convenient that it takes like two to three minutes for the red matter bomb thing to destroy Vulcan when in every other circumstance in a movie like this, it would be instant, <laughs> but it just has to give them enough time to evacuate everyone again. Yeah, no reason I mean, for it. <laughs> this is it, you know, it, it has such a gravity, gravity, I can't even say the gravity effect that it, it actually draws light into it because it's a black hole, yeah. So it, its power or strength is greater than the speed of light. Hmm. But it takes three minutes to pull a planet's core through. Yeah, despite the fact that when we see it finally destroyed, it's moving at a real rate of speed. So yeah. presumably it was just incredibly slow for two minutes, just until everyone got off the planet and then decided to collapse. Yeah, <laughs> it's sort of building up and that sort of thing. It's a very thoughtful weapon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it would be nice. destroy you, <laughs> Actually, you when 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 they got there late, actually, just to to roll back to that, but it would have been nice to have seen a little bit more of a space battle there. Mm. You know, they get there late just as the other ships are getting destroyed. And... Yeah, but the the thing is, the Enterprise is so outmatched that any space battle there would make absolutely no sense. It only the only reason the ship survives is because Nero's like, it's the Enterprise, don't destroy it, otherwise they could have just wiped it out anyway. Um, well, that's it, yeah. But which that's the problem with these films, though. They make a lot of kind of OP god tech type stuff, and then they can't write a way around why it wouldn't just immediately destroy everything and create multiple problems. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's that's a writing problem, I guess. <laughs> um, speaking of which, the destruction of Vulcan, no, just no. 
no, <laughs> I'm not having it. You do not do that. <laughs> well, uh, oh, you make me want to comment about something. So the movie where they changed a big thing <laughs> recently. No, go ahead. You know you want to. No, no, no it, it's not relevant to this. Oh, it is, it is bloody we, relevant. You said we'd disagree at some point. Yeah. And I said that should never happen. You yeah. shouldn't, that, that is not how that t- movie should have finished. Hmm. And yeah, so if if they can make that sort of change, well, why can't they do that? As it's a big spoiler, I won't get into specifically what, but yes, your argument that it's an alternate timeline was a similar argument I used against you, why something is fine. And yes, I can't give you reasons for that. I can just say that you don't destroy Vulcan. <laughs> 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 to look at it the other way, if it had been Earth, would you be fine with it? Because I wouldn't. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, so I just think that was that was purely just like, hey, we have to give some kind of stake, so let's do something in my opinion, completely ridiculous for no good reason. But uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it does give you the cool scene with uh, Spock watching his mother die with uh, a transporter that apparently can't lock on for, again, no good reason. <laughs> he managed to get there where they were free falling hmm. and all that. Yeah, you only, you, it was like one, two seconds off. I mean, that's just like swipe down. It's, hmm. already, it's already done. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's all tech and all that sort of stuff. And we don't know exactly yeah. how we locked onto them. You know, there was no technical techno babble explaining how we managed to get that lock yeah, onto them. I mean, it's you see the really visual cool. of it and you can kind of extrapolate it from that. But, mm. I mean, that, that that whole thing is purely just to give Chekhov something to do other than really terrible bloody Russian accent jokes, which, oh, oh yes. weak, weak top two computer. No, just no. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I would love to know how fast uh, Spock runs because obviously he transports down when there's three minutes before the planet yeah, grows. Yeah, exactly. He, yeah. get, he somehow gets from where he was yeah. to there and then runs into the archives and then back out to that point in three mm. minutes. I'm like, well, again, this is, this is a function of the film that just literally does whatever the plot wants it to because why does he bother to run down to the transporter room when later in the film you can transport beam from a planet to just the middle of the engineering section? Just beam them straight from the bridge. You're in, you're in a hurry. <laughs> and again, convenient that it was like, can't we beam them? You don't have to go down for them. No, they'll be in this very well-shielded place that you can't beam out of. Again, terrible design then, Vulcans, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, you might not want things nicked, but at the same time... <laughs> <laughs> I love that idea that the, everybody's security in the 24th or 23rd century is just like putting things that can't be beamed because there's just a spate of people flying over planets and beaming valuables away. <laughs> just a bunch of people going, ah, oh, dang it! <laughs> God, gee, there is. <laughs> just trying to grab thin air as somebody steals their futuristic DVD player or whatever. Ah! Fire a chip overhead again. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, um. Don't love that immediately afterwards you get Kirk kicked completely off the ship because it's never like t- as soon as that happened in every time I watch this film, I'm like, and why didn't he just send him to the brig? <laughs> yeah. Seems like an odd choice, other than the fact that the script needs Kirk to meet Scotty and old Spock. Uh, yeah. but again, that's that's pl- that's plot dictating what your characters do when it should be the other way around. Um because mm. it's blatant, just it's it's transparent. Oh, just we need we need them to get from A to B, so just whatever type writing which bugs the crap out of me whenever it happens. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, and I just don't like Delta Vega anyway because that entire sequence is just like, that's Abrams because he likes Star Wars, just writing a Star Wars movie. <laughs> Those <laughs> creatures chasing him and whatever, that's got nothing to do with Star Trek. That's Star yeah. Wars, <laughs> that entire thing. You want these Hoth, that's what you wanted. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and those creatures from uh, episode two. But yeah, it just doesn't feel Star Trek. And this is where the film gets really, to me, like slow and really poorly paced because at this point you're... You're just delaying whatever you, we know is going to have to happen, which is Kirk and Spock getting back on the ship and Kirk getting command and whatever else. So this, uh, I love that we have Leonard Nimoy in that scene, and I wouldn't lose that. Um, but all this stuff just seems like padding. Like you could have just had Scotty on the ship in the first place, um, if you know what I mean, uh, and then not have to go and meet him and do that and not have to invent this transport beaming that ruins your entire universe and whatever yeah, else. But again, shuttlecraft. I, <laughs> how this shuttlecraft had a transporter i don't know i, I don't see because i'm not a film script writer how you would bring spock prime into the story any other way but you could definitely have had scotty just be on the ship to avoid that part of needing to introduce him somehow um and again like 
introducing stuff that shouldn't exist in that universe or any universe because that they say that like spock says that the reason he knows it is because scotty of what we know of the like the prime timeline or whatever came up with the solution or the, the formula for trans warp beaming and yeah. beaming onto starships and stuff okay so, so why is everybody in like lower decks and picard prodigy why are they not just constantly doing that <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, anyway. that, that is true. <laughs> it's very true when you know it. <laughs> but no, again, it's awesome to see uh, to see Spock Brightman. Uh, and Nemo always brings the goods, so he's 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 fantastic. He always is. Again, my favorite character, favorite actor playing them. It's brilliant, and it's kind of good that he gives you the exposition because it doesn't feel so heavy of like Romulus's destruction and uh, this is Nero's motivation, and this is kind of how the timeline split. Uh, which again, I actually think is pretty clever. I've never had an issue with that. I know some people might, but with me, I'm like, okay, that's a cool way to make it both a sequel and completely start over and literally have the scene of dialogue with Spock later on the bridge saying everything's been changed, so now anything can happen. Um, so in the next movie, we'll just introduce the same villain. <laughs> but, <you know. laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely I mean, anything can happen. I am Khan. Oh, well, how convenient. <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> like, uh, I didn't like Peg's portrayal of Scotty. I think he's too much of a stupid comedy relief type character. Uh, I yeah. think trans, yeah, trans warp beaming, stupid idea, breaks your universe. The joke about Admiral Archer's prime beagle, stupid joke. That's the one bit of fan service joke that I'm like, no, it's stupid and it doesn't work. One thing that is definitely stupid and you will not sell me on. Yes, we know they filmed in the Budweiser brewery, but engineering of a starship doesn't look anything like a flipping brewery. At least make an effort to disguise it. It yes, looks ridiculous. I, I was thinking you know, that it looks like a brewery or something like that. Yep. Um, I do like the more industrial sort of thing that they, they brought in in comparison to like the original I, Enterprise. Yeah, I just don't because there's no reason why you would have water pipes in engineering. Surely that's the okay. most dangerous possible thing you could have in there. Yeah, that big empty space with pipes in for no reason. In the rest yeah, just of the pipes, pipes no that purpose. were clearly like, having water flowing around them. That's like me oh, going, oh yeah, yeah that's, that's my electricity cupboard right there next to my sink. It's a tad dangerous, you know? I could probably show you some houses like that as well. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, but this is uh, the Federation flagship. Who designed it? That, I mean, I don't know why, why are the pipes see through. Exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. just, yeah. It, it's an, an, an odd scene. Um, yeah, they could have had them appear anywhere, but it was another bit of drama. But yeah, I think something I definitely certainly noticed a lot in the movie. There was a lot of comedy for the mm. sake of comedy. Yes. Uh, Sometimes it worked, as I say, the, the sort of McCoy type scenes and stuff. Comedy, when it comes from character, I think kind of worked. But when it's forced and when it's when it turns a character into someone they're not. So when it's like Peg being Scotty as some kind of, oh, I, I, oh can you believe me? Oh, okay. It's like, no, Scotty was funny and he was like a drunkard or whatever else. And he had his moments, but he was never like, oh, oh look at me. Woo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in the way that he's portrayed in this movie. Yeah, yeah. Although, having said that, I did like his constant funny jokes about being hungry. <laughs> you come from the future. Huh? Did they still have sandwiches there? <laughs> and also, and I don't know if this is an improv, the idea that they say, like, is there any other starving stuffy officers in Keenza? The little dude behind him is like, me. And he goes, you, you shut up. You eat nothing. You can have, like, a bean and you'd be full. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why that's funny, but it amused me no end. Um <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. That's like just throwing in a, a an alien for the sake of it. That character did not need to be there. No, but I can forgive it. He's got his little assistant type mate, and it's a nice touch that he turns up on the Enterprise eventually because he's kind of sad and crestfallen when they uh, beam without him. So at the end, he's there in his little Starfleet uniform in engineering, still climbing on stuff. It's like, yeah. oh, yay! <laughs> mm -hmm. I can live with it. Um, yeah, the Kirk provoking Spock is a really good scene. I really like mm. it um, because it's it makes absolute sense and it's lucky that Sarek was on the bridge to stop Spock killing him <laughs> as well. Um, yeah, harsh word. You think, you know... Fuck. <laughs> the fact well, that no, security have just took him to the bridge and they're watching their captain beat a man to death almost. Uh, and... He's the captain. You wouldn't be like, get off him, man in charge. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you know, that's just, I'm sure there's some laws there. He's not the... You know, and, is not beyond question. Yeah, don't talk to me about there's some kind of laws here when literally the very next scene is I'm in command now. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you in command? Because.
because I said so. <laughs> well, no, no, you know, uh, Sulu just say, you know. Yes, uh, Pike he... assigned him to be first officer. Okay, that's fine. Pike is not the man you just replaced. It was Spock. He was in charge. Did Spock make him first officer? No. Then he's not. It goes to the next person. <laughs> but Spock obviously didn't give himself a first off uh, officer. Well, there would be a second officer on the ship who command would go to. It's not yeah. just like they would go, ooh, Pike made you first officer when he was in command two captains ago. <laughs> if, if, you know, if, if Spock's not taking care of business and you know, assigning himself a first officer to, to get rid of Kirk, then so uh, yeah, he deserves it. It's so dumb. Um, Sarek and Spock's little motivational heart-to-heart, I think, is lovely. Uh, it's really nice that Sarek's like, uh, your mother would tell you not to let go of that anger. And uh, yeah, yes, in the past, I might have said it was logical or whatever, but the reason I'm out with her is because I loved her. Um, that should really break the universe, but I love it anyway because it makes perfect character sense. So I'm fine with it. I actually love it. Um, mm, yeah. That he's admitting to that. And like, yes, we all do have emotions and it's nice sometimes to give into it or whatever else. I just think it's a great scene. Uh, and speaking of great scenes, the shot of the Enterprise rising over Saturn, because that's where they're mm. kind of they're sneaking behind to, to get unseen to the Narada. That shot is the best shot in the movie. Uh, that's the best visual, at least, definitely. Um, it just looks amazing. Even the yeah. ship that I don't like the design of looks incredible in that scene. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah, it is. There's you know, the music all kicking up, uh, and yeah, it's a great, great thing. Yeah. I think it was using the trailer, actually. I wouldn't be surprised. It's a very well-done scene. But uh, yeah, the, the next few scenes I've just basically written... I, I glossed over. It's just mindless action at this point. It's just, you know, <laughs> boom, boom, zap, zap, shoom, shoom. Yeah, great. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and then they end up getting Captain Pike back and killing the bad guys and whatever. Um, it's nice that there's at least an attempt to be moral with Kirk sort of saying, oh, we're, we're, we're being logical, saying we can rescue anyone from there. But I hate the fact Spock's the one that's like, not this time. This time, murder people. Ha ha, I'm fine with it. And then literally it just takes Nero, one person, to go, I will not accept your help before they go, all right, fire every weapon we've got. For again, no reason. He's getting sucked into a black hole anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let's just, just finish them off a bit more. It's just right. overkill. It's just literally like, ha, ah, we want to give you a heroic moment of anger, so waste every freaking bit of weapons power we've got. <laughs> yeah. Um and again, the fact that then you end that scene with them getting sucked into the black hole at the end, it's just drama for the sake of it. And it's like that whole Lord of the Rings four endings kind of thing. It's like, all right, get on with it. <laughs> oh, we've defeated the threat. Oh, there's another threat. Oh, there's a... Just end the bloody movie. <laughs> how come that black hole doesn't take them to you know another timeline? <laughs> well, I did wonder that. How come it didn't make them time travel? And also, does that mean that in the Kelvin timeline, there's now just constantly a black hole just outside Earth? <laughs> it doesn't go anywhere. You can't... It's not like it disappears. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That would have a massive gravitational effect on uh, all future things. Yeah, well, there would be anyway because there'd be one where Vulcan used to be, which would have some kind of effect. But the fact that there's one on what has to be just outside Earth because he was he was drilling into Earth, so they can't be that far from it. So it's oh, gonna be yeah, that's right an outside. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that that's gonna yeah. If you think the moon can cause a problem, exactly. Yeah, that's just gonna f the heck out of Earth, basically. Yeah. But, but never mind, we defeated the problem by detonating apparently our six or seven warp cores. All right. <laughs> <laughs> the very end scene with the two Spocks is fantastic because, again, Nemo's great and Quinto's great. But um, And I love the whole, like, my customary farewell would be self-serving, which is a clever little thing. Um, but the whole rest of the ending is just everybody getting where they, quote-unquote, need to be way too fast. Uh, and it's just to get them there. And it's like, yes, I get the heroic triumphant ending and... They're all in the correct uniforms and in the right place and shooting off. And then you've got the narration from the opening of the original series. And yes, it's great, but it's like, it's not earned, in my opinion, frankly. I just don't like it. And the, especially Kirk, the fact that the literally Into Darkness literally starts with them going, we're demoting you because you aren't ready yet. All right, well, you're the one that put him there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just a couple of quick notes that I'd like to make. Yes, there's a lot of cool special effects visuals and stuff, but yeah, the lens flare ridiculously <laughs> over <sighs> It's true, though. Yes, it's cliche, but my word, it's true. Mm. It doesn't need to look like that. Just like the interior of the Enterprise. First of all, engineering isn't a brewery. Second of all, the bridge, the transport pad, they're not Apple stores. You know what I mean? Mm. <laughs> not everything has to be clean and white with the latest tech and the 
blooming shiny window screen and whatever else? No. Let me just end with a positive so as I don't sound completely like a negative Nelly and say that I love the music in this film. It's very good. Michael Giacchino is fantastic and the way he uses the light motifs and the bits and pieces from the actual original series and the Trek franchise is really good. And I have probably listened to the soundtrack to this movie more times than I've actually watched the movie, <laughs> which says a lot. Um, so, yeah. So then that would um, and stick around because we do have some of the usual sort of audience responses. And there's quite a lot, as in a ton, <laughs> when I put this tweet out asking about Star Trek 09. But before we get to that, let's give our thoughts. So we always go conclusion and then uh, score out of five, either five stars or five star fleet deltas. Uh, and as you're my guest, let me just throw it to you, Stephen, and say, do you have a conclusion and a score out of five? It was good to see the return of Star Trek. And yeah. Well, in some parts, it wasn't as Star Trek as it could have been. It was a bit, you know, the comedy was there for, for no reason uh, and certain other bits. Uh, I think it was an enjoyable movie, and it, it certainly brought it back for a new generation. Um, it's disappointing that they've not managed to keep it going. Um, yeah, for obviously all the various reasons involved in that, even though they keep on mentioning it, something oh, yes, they've got everyone back on board and stuff like that, and then that happened, and the rest of it. Um, I'm, I'm gonna go with a very lazy three, so three out of five would be yours. Yeah, score. it's not Fair a bad enough. movie. Um, it's not uh, Undiscovered Country, Undiscovered Country is great. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, anyway, um, okay. Well, I'll give you my conclusion. It, it doesn't look as long as I thought it was, but maybe I'll make a meal of it. Uh, I just said a frequently entertaining and enjoyable movie, but with myriad flaws uh, that fundamentally misunderstands and often misrepresents the franchise whose name it bears. A lot of the problems are well known, but they are still true. Overuse of lens flare, being more Star Wars than Star Trek, mindless action, ugly ship design, especially the interior, and a Swiss cheese plot. Uh, but it's not all bad. The actors all do at least a serviceable job portraying the familiar characters. But the particular highlights are Chris Pine, Carl Urban, and Zachary Quinto. Uh, there are some great character moments which do understand the tenets of Star Trek. The effects look polished and cinema worthy, other than the flares. Uh, and the central sort of alternate timeline idea is pretty genius. Plus, uh, Leonard Nimoy as Spock is the best thing in the franchise, in my opinion. So this film has his presence going for it. Uh, overall, it's an enjoyable space action flick. If you want to disengage your brain and enjoy it washing over you as a trek film it has its moments and it's not the worst but it is probably in my bottom three or four uh and i would say 2.5 two and a half stars out of five. Oh, uh, i thought we were going to massively disagree i did but uh yeah so that would obviously make our average and thus the final score would be 2.75 out of five for Star Trek 2009. Yeah, definitely not bad. And I'm certainly not one of these people that's like all new Trek and all Kurtzman Trek and whatever else is, is terrible because uh, just out, you know, at risk of spoiling future reviews, I love Star Trek Beyond and I'm very on board with 90% probably of the newer stuff. Um, you know, the TV stuff that Kurtzman's come out with. Uh, so definitely not that. It's not a matter of this isn't my Star Trek. Um, but yeah, just for me, this film doesn't quite work as a Trek film. Um, so, yeah, that would be uh, our thoughts on the matter. But what about everyone else? So as I often do for these things in uh, podcasts, either the movie related or the Star Trek, I put out a tweet just asking all of my followers uh, to say, um, you know, what was your thoughts on Star Trek 2009? Share it below and we will uh, we'll see what everyone says. Uh, apologies, this might take a little while because I do have... Uh, a lot of responses, but I'll try and get to them as best I can and cut out. There's a lot of detours and irrelevant kind of conversations that they got into about things like Wrath of Khan and Into Darkness that we'll not share. That would have to wait for another time, but let me just start by saying at NerdPerson5, uh, the question I asked was just um, what are your thoughts on J.J. Abrams' Star Trek 2009? What do you love or hate? Did you think it was an overall good brackets Trek film? Uh, and at NerdPerson5 says, I love them. They are the first Star Trek films I've watched. And no matter what you think of the Kelvin films, they're fun to watch. Okay. Um, the Metal Hoovian, brackets James, says, I love the Kelvin timeline films. The cast performances and music are top tier and the aesthetics are gorgeous. Uh, and Natalia Q just responds underneath with this pointing upwards little arrow meme. So clearly agreement. <laughs> At Captain Sean 24 says, I think it's a really good movie and really good Star Trek reboot. The negatives is lens flare. <laughs> 
uh, I also think it has too much action. It should have a good amount, but it, I feel like it was too much action and not enough exploring. This goes for the two movies after this one. Okay. Um, at Madahar Jazz says, not great, sorry, but it's got none of the pathos of the original cast movies. Mm. Uh, at Ro Birch, Rob Birch says, as a reintroduction to Star Trek, it's still solid. It gets the core of the characters and Starfleet's mission down nicely, and it's an entertaining ride. However, Kirk jumping from cadet to captain in the space of a week is a bit of a stretch, even if Pine makes a better Kirk. Yeah. Ooh, that's a controversial <laughs> subject. I think possibly that might be true, but yeah. Uh, Robert, uh, Robert again responded to his own tweet with that and said, I think it's hampered by a need to get all the core characters to where they need to be by the end, rushing through pretty much everyone's career path. The crew in the original series are all veterans, while this crew are mostly still relatively new to Starfleet, and a lot of it just sort of happens. I don't disagree with you. <laughs> yeah. mm. um, Set Beard to Stun says, uh, <laughs> I love them, all three. I've been a fan of Trek since the 80s, so I was always going to watch them. But I think the Kelvin movies are a great introduction to Star Trek when it seems too daunting for a newbie to dive into the series. The in-universe alternate timeline was a brilliant idea to allow them to do a rebooted series but not be held hostage by established canon. Also, the casting for the known characters was spot on. I would be happy with the Bones spin-off. Yeah, that's fair enough. Uh, at Niall underscore Maxted says, it's amazing. I honestly watched it nine times at the cinema. It's how I perceive Trek as a kid. My mother, who's been a Star Trek fan since a child, loved it. Uh, e Kelly 1701 says, great cast wasted on a ridiculous screenplay that made no sense, but you know, pew pew and explosions. Really wish they'd just told a good original series tale, Star Trek Beyond manage this, rather than including Prime Spock and wasting good screen time on alternate universes and timelines. Oof. Uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, at Starfleet Dad or Kayshon says, just watched it again last night. It's a great movie, solid Trek feel. They got the scale of the Enterprise interior all wrong, though. Looking from the outside, the inside wouldn't fit. The water turbine is crazy, reminds me of Galaxy Quest and the Chompers, <laughs> but it's a great <laughs> ride. I, lo I, I love that reference. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. at Professor Shaky says, I liked it, I thought it was perfectly cast. Carl Urban was outstanding in all capitals as Bones. Uh, to which at Sophie S. Rap replies, really enjoyed it as well. Urban as Bones was fantastic, and I think Chris Pine was a really good choice for Tiberius. I presume she means Kirk. <laughs> uh, at George underscore White 96, my friend George White says, uh, I love 2009. Darkness is meh. There's no need for Khan, and Beyond is bloody gorgeous. Uh, at Simarad, who often responds to my tweets, just says, Beyond is definitely my favourite. Uh, and I agreed with both of them, as we've already been over. <laughs> so there you go. Um, Laurie Claudio says, Because you asked, I liked the new cast. I hated the story, but only because they rewrote Spock's history, which is our future. I've dubbed it the Abram Nation. It obliterated the original timeline, not just created an alternate. Oh, it didn't, but okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Jessica Shaffalo says, Good movie, well made, solid script, excellent casting. Love the chemistry between them, mainly reflect the original series well, especially Spock and Bones. Don't love having to accept and track another timeline, but not throwing a fit about it. Great mix of humour and heart, which is very Star Trek. Uh, mm -hmm. At Simarad uh, gave his own thoughts as well and said, it was fun time in the cinema and I've watched and enjoyed it on Blu-ray since then, but it's full of logical flaws and things which make no sense when you engage your brain. Also, I really don't like the design of the Enterprise inside and out, brewery and Apple Store bridge. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah. I'm just going to quickly... Yeah, uh, uh, Shaka Jamal says, I couldn't really get into it. The scenes with Leonard Nimoy were the best parts for me. The cast was great and acting was good. I did not like the Enterprise. The Kelvin Enterprise is my least liked Star Trek ship. The effects were distracting and the premise was irritating. <laughs> there you go. Oh, uh, dear. Um, yeah. if, if you're interested, uh, viewers and listeners, there's way too much for me to go through because I'd be here for about another hour, but do go to at Ian Mike Wilson, my Twitter account, and uh, and I it's all there. I'll uh, make sure that it's accessible, and I'll possibly retweet it on the at HOM uh, Star Trek um, Twitter as well. But there's like I'm scrolling down, and there's an unbelievable amount of feedback about this movie. So there's definitely, uh, as I'm reading through it, very mixed opinions, and a lot of them I think reflect a lot of the things that we said, either positive or negatively. But I think, uh, yeah, I, I don't think 2.75 is a ridiculous overall score uh, for the movie so uh whew. so that will be uh, the end of this episode if you're listening to this on the silver screen podcast channel uh, we will be putting videos up semi-regularly that are film related and only film related uh, to that one so 
do keep an eye on things there as well uh yeah and in the meantime just let me say again thank you so much for joining me uh, for this one Stephen, to launch a second channel and to conclude the one that you started already <laughs> uh, happy to help happy to help awesome awesome and uh, did you have any uh, anything you quickly wanted to plug no no i don't have anything to plug like that ah oh, fair enough um you can find me, as I've said, at Ian Mike Wilson. The, the podcast is at HOM Trek or Home Trek. Uh, and the other podcast is at podcast underscore screen. And that's the Silver Screen new Twitter channel. Uh, and we'll give you the link to the correct YouTube channel and everything as well going forward. Um, yeah. So again, thank you very much, Stephen. Make sure that you let me know if there's any movies you particularly want to come back on and review uh, or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. Enjoy. And everyone out there, take care. I hope you've enjoyed the various bits of podcast content that I've been putting out. So look after yourselves, keep going to movies and enjoying them. And in the words of Arnie, I'll be back.